word of the Lord from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, church family. I'm Brian Scott, the lead pastor here at Twin City Bible Church. Uh, thank you, missions team, for sharing updates from the Craybills and also uh, the prayers for the persecuted church. I've had the privilege of meeting persecuted Christians myself from various nations, from North Korea, from China, and other places, and uh, it's dear to my heart. I certainly have practiced praying for uh, persecuted Christians all over the world and I encourage us all to do so. Uh, um, we'll, we'll transition here into the Word. I encourage you to, uh, if you've not already done so, to, to mute your videos and to open the, your, your Bibles and open your heart as we go before the Lord to receive His Word. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for our time together. Thank you, Lord, for technology allowing us to uh, worship uh, together in the, under our circumstances. We pray uh, Lord, your peace over our land, your peace in our hearts, uh, your grace today as we approach you and uh, come before you to worship you by listening to your word. Speak to us today. Help me today, Lord Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it has been uh, quite a week. We, by the way, we are um, in our Rooted series. Uh, we're, the, the title today is Resolving Conflict in the church, resolving conflict in the church. We are picking up, as we just heard, uh, Philippians 4, verses 2 and 3. Um, it, it, it has been quite a week in our, uh, our lives this week. It has been a very intriguing and interesting week, a uh, very unusual week. Uh, it's been very nice weather here locally in Champaign um, in having 70 degree days. Uh, of course, that's not what has been the most interesting and intriguing part of the week. It's obviously been the election and the results of the election and waiting to hear those results and the conflict that has been built up in the whole campaign process. And here we are on the other side of that. Um, I think one of the most humbling aspects of our election results is that no matter whom we voted for, if you voted uh, this week, if you're here in the United States and are able to vote, um, then you have at least 70 million people who disagreed with you. Uh, that's very humbling. And it's important to remember that as we think about the way uh, conflict has been structured. Well, we're talking about conflict of a different nature, conflict that happens within the church. Paul is addressing conflict here, and there's three sort of uh, points we want to draw out of that. The priority of addressing conflict, the process of reconciliation, the perspective of eternity. The priority of addressing conflict, the process of reconciliation, perspective of eternity. Uh, let's look at our first point here, the priority of addressing conflict. Paul says in verse 2, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. What an interesting verse. You know, in a lot of ways, we, we think about this week and how interesting and intriguing this uh, week has been in a lot of ways and all sorts of re reactions emotionally to that. Perhaps, perhaps today you're feeling uh, relieved, perhaps you're angered, perhaps you are saddened, perhaps you may be uh, just completely indifferent. Uh, but no matter what you may be feeling today, um, I trust that our, our, our worship experience will bring perspective. And it's an interesting perspective that we find here in the scripture passage because Paul, he's, he calls out these two women. Now, if you think about the context of what we've been reading about in Philippians, there has been the heights of the highest Christology in chapter two, for example, in verses six through 11, the Christ hymn, talking about how Jesus, the son of God, how he left the glory of heaven, he considered equality with God something not uh, 
worth of worth worthy of being grasped, but he humbled himself and he took the form of a servant. We think about, for example, how Paul talked has spoken of the depth of his emotion for the Philippian people. How in chapter one, for example, he talked he says that um, I have deep affection for you and that uh, I long for you with the affection of Christ. I hold you in my heart in chapter one, verses seven and eight. You know, he's, he's talked about some of these most quotable statements from the apostle Paul in chapter one, 20, chapter one, verse 21, it says, to live is Christ and to die is gain, as, as Paul was imminently facing death while he's in prison writing this letter. Uh, and, and, and we read not too recently about how Paul says that I count everything as loss in chapter three uh, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And so Paul's, he's, he's way up here, you know, in, in his letter, but then in this particular couple of verses, he seems to come way down into the weeds in calling out these two women. What's going on with that? Perhaps if we approach the text with this sort of 21st century Western mindset, a little bit persuaded by a feminist perspective, we might think, well, Paul, you see, he's a misogynist and he's calling these two women out. I mean, look, earlier he talked highly of these other two guys, Timothy and Epaphroditus, and he's bringing up these two women. Is he looking down on them? Actually, as we look a little closer, quite the contrary. But why is he getting into the weeds? Why is he addressing this particular conflict? No doubt there is a need for this conflict to be addressed. The question though is, well, who are these women? What can we know about them? There's really nothing in outside of this particular text in all of scripture that would illuminate who these women were or anything about their uh, biography we could only determine based on the internal evidence of what's mentioned here and what's happening in the whole of the scripture of the, the text of Philippians. But consider the, the characterization that Paul presents to us about Euodia and Syntyche. He says in verse three, yes, I ask you also true companion, help these women who have labored side by side <clears throat> with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. They've labored with Paul <clears throat> side by side, he says, in the gospel or beside him with Clement, someone else of whose identity we are uncertain of, lots of speculation and sort of uh, the commentary, commentator world, but we don't really know for sure who this Clement is, if it's the same person as the Clement of Rome, <clears throat> who later was a church father in, in writings in the second century, we don't know that. Uh, this could be someone completely different. But what's interesting about the wording here, if you're reading the English translation, at least the ESV, it's a little, it may feel a little ambiguous. Who here is Paul talking about that labored side by side with him in the gospel? If you notice, it says, I ask you also true companion, help these women who have labored. Is the true companion the one who labored with Paul or was it these two women who labored with Paul? ESV is a little ambiguous. I think if you're reading NIV, it's a little more clear, but in the Greek it's, it's crystal clear because uh, who have labored, that's a, um, uh, you know, that, that phrase that uh, he's talking about the relative pronoun who, so getting into grammar a little bit, but that relative pronoun is both plural and it's feminine. And so clearly Paul is referring back to these two women. They had labored with Paul in the gospel. And though Paul is referencing this true companion, and we don't know who that is exactly either, whether that was a uh, a proper name and that's someone's name, the name companion being a name, or if it's just a general reference to an individual who was a high regardly, highly regarded individual in the church, we don't know. But we do know that these two women who are in conflict, because he's commanding them and urging them to agree using a very strong language, 
entreating them to agree in the Lord, um, they were leaders. They had ministered with Paul. And in fact, he says that along with Clement and those who were also fellow workers with Paul, they, their names are written in the book of life. These two women are true believers. And that's important because throughout the letter thus far, Paul, Paul's made some very clear distinctions of not only what who is in the church and who's outside of it, and, and also those to look out for even among the believers of not to follow after their way. Here's what I mean. Paul talks about at the end of chapter one, uh, he encourages the church to be in unity and to be standing firm uh, in one mind, not being afraid in any way of those who are their opponents. He's talking about non-believers outside the church. He's saying, don't be afraid. In the similar way, we were just listening to the video and praying for the persecuted church. The encouragement is, don't be afraid of those who persecute you. Don't be afraid of those outside. That's a distinction. The, the sort of ethos of the church is not to placate towards one's uh, opponents outside of, of, of the church and say, well, it's really not that important what we believe and let's just try to find common ground. That's not the ethos of the church. Paul says, hold on to who your identity is as followers of Christ. Hold on to the word of God that defines who you are and who you have become, having been taken out of darkness and put into God's marvelous light and being a part of his kingdom. Paul also had distinctions in the earlier in chapter three, when he talked about the circumcision party, the Judaizers, those that claimed Christ was not sufficient. It was Christ plus, Christ plus circumcision, Christ plus following the law that achieved salvation. Paul says, be, oh, be on guard, uh, look out for them. They're, they're like dogs. And, and so there's a distinction there. And later in chapter three, we read um, uh, not long ago and uh, last week even, where Paul talks about those whose God is their belly and those that um, they're enemies of the cross. So Paul's created some distinctions. And by the way, the folks that he's talking about, the last two categories would include people who, who attend the church, who are in the church, who consider themselves a part of it. So for Paul to talk to these women and say that their names are in the book of life, they're not women in these other categories. They are true believers. They're Christians. Yet they were in conflict. And not only were they in conflict, not only were they true believers, they were ministers. They had walked side by side with the apostle himself. They were not those that sit on the back row. And of course, nowadays, no one sits on the back row because we are unable to really meet in person. But they weren't the last ones to kind of sneak in and as worship is started and sit down and sort of the first ones to leave so they don't have to engage anyone in the worship service. They were some of the first ones to show up for church and some of the last ones to leave after they've talked with people and ministered to people and prayed with people. They were two women who could be ministry leaders, ministry team leaders. They could have been on the missions committee and, or they could be on our uh, shepherding committee. They could be on staff. These women had clout, they had responsibility. They had influence. What do we can take? What can we take away from that? It's a it's a long-standing occurrence for Christian leaders to be in conflict. For conflict to happen, even within the church, their salvation was not in question here. Their maturity was not in question. Their giftings were not in question, but their disagreement needed to be put in check. They weren't church members complaining about the music or the car color of the carpet, they were more likely ones who led the music or who were deciding about uh, things like the decor or policy or ministry or other engagements happening in the church. These women were leaders. 
they were experienced ministers and they were in conflict with one another. Their conflict was causing dissension in the church. Again, why would Paul drill down on this level to address their disagreement unless there was some severe uh, impact of that disagreement on the body itself? Conflict and sharp disagreements are issues that even mature believers can be involved in. Now, I do wanna create a distinction. Their conflict was of such nature and of such length and of such intertwined um, you know, issues and emotion that it required resolution. It required to be brought up and addressed. There was some impact that was happening here on a very large scale. Paul had to address it. There's other disagreements and other conflict that can happen among uh, Christians and among mature believers. It doesn't have that impact at all. Here's an example. Paul himself had been in a sharp uh, disagreement and a conflict with his ministry partner, Barnabas. And we can read about that in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15, verse 39. They had taken a young disciple, Mark, along with them in journey and in missions and ministering. Mark, he abruptly left and abandoned them and had to go back home. Paul didn't think too highly of that. And in fact, when they were going to go, Paul and Barnabas, on their second missionary journey, Paul says to Barnabas, Mark cannot come. He cannot come with us. And Barnabas is saying, well, what do you mean? I mean, he, you know, he's, he's a young guy. We need to give him another chance. And Paul says, no. And the scripture says their, their disagreement was so sharp, they parted ways. Barnabas took Mark and they went off. Paul grabbed Silas and he has Timothy and and then they go and they start revisiting the places that Paul and Barnabas had formerly visited. Disagreement can happen. Conflict can happen among Christian leaders. And in that particular case, what we see happening is that the gospel still spreads, that God's kingdom still increases, that the word of God still goes forth. And there was not any ramification that at least the scripture presents to us of that particular disagreement. Interesting to note, though, Paul and Mark eventually reconcile. And Paul speaks highly of him, for example, uh, in some of the epistles in Colossians 4.10. So their disagreement, which had mission implications, ends up later being interpersonally reconciled and resolved. He speaks highly of Mark later on. Not all disagreements in the church are necessarily disruptive to church life such as Paul and Barnabas, or you could think about denominational disagreement or disruptions that have, that have happened in the sense that denominations were formed because of disagreement uh, or mission agencies were formed because of disagreement. Uh, there's a lot of just things that exist in the church world that actually started because of some sort of disagreement. And that's not entirely a bad thing. They end up impacting more people as a result theological emphases that one denomination has or another actually becomes a blessing to the whole of the church. If one denomination, their emphasis is the word of God, another denomination may emphasize missions, another may emphasize youth. That's something that the whole church can glean from as they, as they engage in those theological and missional emphases. Um, not all disagreements and conflict are of a disruptive nature. Even for my family and I, part of the reason in our journey to be here with you all in Champaign-Urbana involved a missional disagreement. A year ago, I, it's hard to believe, but a year ago, Becca and I, we were praying and considering uh, planting a church in, in Harlem, in New York City. But because of conversation and, you know, we had folks that were excited to be a part of that and to be a part of the, you know, financially and otherwise, um, because of conversation that happened about the strategy of that and the viability of that, there was a disagreement. And as a result, that was a launching point for us to fully pursue what it was God really intended for us to do. We look back on that and we are thankful for that disagreement because we wouldn't be here without it. We wouldn't have been forced to broaden the scope of what we were considering God to be doing without that important part of our journey. 
But this particular conflict between Euodia and Syntyche was disruptive. This particular conflict had implications for the whole church. In fact, some uh, commentators would say, this is the reason why Paul is talking so strongly about unity. Their conflict had boiled over to, to the extent that many were involved and engaged in it. Perhaps they leveraged their power and their, their uh, sort of persuasiveness to get others on board to their side. Perhaps they were fighting over a church budget for their ministry or properties that how the church should decide what to buy, you know, what to acquire or as, um, you know, as leaders, they, they, whatever the issue was, and Paul doesn't mention it here, but they had somehow their influence as leaders had seeped their disagreement into the church. And perhaps because they were leaders, members of the church were too intimidated to address their disagreement. As a result, Paul's imploring them to stand in unity, to have the agreement, the mindset, the very mindset, that word meaning the mindset of Christ, the same word he used earlier in chapter two, he's imploring them to be in agreement. That is why there's a priority to addressing conflict. Our second point here is the process of reconciliation. The process of reconciliation. Paul, he says to whoever the true companion is, he says to my true companion, to mediate this particular conflict, to mediate. Not all conflicts in the church reside, or require mediation. Uh, in fact, as Jesus teaches about conflict in, um, in the gospel of Matthew in chapter 18, he says, if there's ever a sin that occurs between one member of the church and another, that that should be a private matter, that one should address the other privately and if you win the person over and they repent, then that's resolved. This is clearly not what was happening here. These two women could not resolve the conflict on their own. Think about it. Paul was hundreds of miles away. Epaphrodites, Epaphrodites had traveled from uh, Philippi to present to him the offering that the Philippian church took up on his behalf to minister to him. Paul is in prison most likely in Rome, could have been somewhere else in the, in the empire, but most likely in the city of Rome, hundreds of miles away from Philippi. And so when Epaphroditus presents the offering, likely what happens is he's telling uh, Paul about what's going on in the church. So you think about the timing it would take for Epaphroditus to get from point A to B, and he, by the way, got severely ill on the way, and I'm sure delayed either his process of arrival or just even the process of, so, of sort of recuperating from that trip. Um, we know that this particular conflict had been going on for quite some time. For Paul to then write about it, send word back to the church, knowing that it would not be resolved by the time or before the letter arrived. It required a mediator. So in the process of dealing with conflict that affects um, many people or multiple people or the church at large, mediation is an important part of that. But another thing that I want to point out that Paul does here as he is addressing the process of reconciliation is that Paul leverages honor rather than shame. I mean, think about it. This is a letter that would be read to the whole congregation. Everyone would hear their names being called out. But Paul doesn't say, you know, you two leaders, you should have done this or you shouldn't be doing that. That's not his language at all. He references them as those who were his uh, co-workers. They had struggled together with him. In fact, that word is a word for athletic struggle and persevering, that they had fought with him side by side for the gospel. He honors who they are in the presence of the whole community. He uses honor instead of shame. Often as we resolve conflict, we use shame instead of honor. Whether that's conflicts in our home, as parents trying to mediate between uh, the conflict of siblings, whether in the workplace, 
whether that be uh, as you know one spouse to the other, whether that be whatever our you know friendships or other relationships, we often use shame as a way to motivate people. Shame, uh, Brene Brown, who is a you know therapist and speaker and writer, she says is the most powerful master emotion. It's the fear that we're not good enough because true belonging only happens when we present our authentic imperfect selves to the world. Our sense of belonging can never be greater than our level of self-acceptance. What is she sh saying and how does that relate? She's saying that fear, uh, shame is very powerful as a motivation. It's also very destructive. And she's likening that self-destruction to internal when we are living in shame and in ourselves but it's also powerful as a motivator and destructive as one when we address those in conflict or the person we're in conflict with in a manner that is shameful paul uses honor he says you've labored with me you've been a partner with me you've struggled with me and though their actions may be dishonorable right now paul is using honor is a careful way to encourage them to come back to reconciliation. The process of reconciliation sometimes needs mediation or mediators, but always should use honor. Our final point here is the perspective of eternity, the perspective of eternity. In uh, the book, Redeeming Church Conflict, the co-authored book by Tara Barthel, whom I told is used to attend TCBC and David Edling, they talk about how they can they counsel church conflict and they bring uh, church conflict back to a point of of conciliation or reconciliation. And as they walk through church conflict, one of the things that they do is that no matter what the situation is, they bring the eternal perspective. They say things like, "Take heart, Christian. Remember eternity, and have hope. Get your eyes off yourself and your circumstances." and fix them firmly on the triune God. They often will point people to the book of Job. Job, who had his whole life turned upside down, unbeknownst to him was what was happening on a, a cosmic level between Satan and the Lord and precip precipitating this event. And his friends came alongside in hoping of helping him, but ultimately made matters much worse as they tried to accuse Job as the reason why he was enduring such hardship. In that process, Job is crying out to God, Lord, I'm a righteous man. I demand a face-to-face -face interaction with you so that I can ask you my questions. And here's how the Lord graciously responds to Job's request at the end towards the end of the book, Job 38, 1 through 7. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know or who has stretched the line upon it? Or what were its bases, on what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, God is not answering Job's questions. He's asking Job questions. And he's saying, where were you when the world was formed? He's changing his whole perspective on his matter at hand. And he's bringing an eternal perspective. And that is exactly what Paul does here. Paul says, your names are written in the book of life. The book of life refers to God's record of his faithful believers. It's something that's referenced all throughout scripture. Your names are written in the book of life. He's imploring an eternal perspective and something that we can use right here and now after the week that we have had an eternal perspective, a global perspective as we think about the persecuted church and the kingdom of God all over the earth and an eternal perspective. As we think about certainly national conflict, but any conflict that we might be involved in on an interpersonal level. What does this mean for us? 
ultimately as Christians, as we think about conflict, I mentioned earlier, sometimes it involves mediator, depending on how bad it gets. We, before knowing Christ, we were sinners without hope. We needed the ultimate mediator, Jesus Christ, to stand in the gap between us and God. Our situation, our conflict with God was so bad that it required Jesus spilling his own blood on our behalf. Romans 5.10 says, for, while, if, for if while we were enemies, enemies with God, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. The fact that we were once sinners who were in desperate need of reconciliation with God, that Jesus stepped in, it humbles us as we think about who we are today, being the benefactor, benefactors of Christ's mediation, but it also instructs us as we think about conflict that we have within the church. We need to engage in conflict in the same way that Christ engaged us, in the same way that Paul instructs here, not with shame, but with honor. Christ could have easily and have been righteous in doing so implored shame upon us. Yet instead, he took our shame that we could receive his honor as the son of God in our reconciliation. As we are engaged in conflict on whatever level we might be or whenever we may face conflict in the future, let us be reminded to honor, not shame, those that are in conflict or those with whom we are in conflict. As we think about the fact that conflict happens, we should be reminded and humbled by the fact that all of us, no matter how mature we are, no matter how long we've known Jesus, we can be in conflict at any point in our lives and in our walk with God. And as we in, see conflict happen around us, not that we necessarily jump in if it's just a minor issue, but certainly if there's ever an issue that becomes disruptive, as a res we have to be a responding community to respond to conflict in a way that brings reconciliation. And I know that for many of you, that has been a reality as we look back over the last few years in the life of the church, you've, many of you have stepped in, but be of good hope. Um, though we are in a very tenuous time as a nation and who knows what the next days ahead a lot are, are for us, um, we can be reminded of our eternal perspective, that our names are written in the book of life, and that ultimately, as we think about unity, God is calling us to be about his mission, to see the gospel uh, move forth in CU and all over the world, to pray for the nations, and to be about reconciliation between God and man all over the earth. A people who are uh, community and campus and community who are transformed by Christ to renew the world. Let us pray. Father, thank you for our worship service this morning. Thank you that uh, even as we think about conflict in our world, conflict that, persecution, that persecuted Christians go through, Lord, encourage us in whatever conflict that we may face here in our own lives. Lord, help us to remember your perspective in our, in our situation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.